blood. Uh, what is a blood moon? I mean, it's in the news, and, and uh, I'm not sure even how many slides that I worked on are actually here, but what is it? Uh, we're going to look at it in the Bible, but this is an example of what we as believers have to be very careful about. There are people who take advantage of verses out of context and make a fortune selling sensational books. I mean, a decade ago it was Bible codes and it was the equidistant lettering uh, that this person, I forget even their name, but they found, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin and, you know, uh, Gorbachev and all this stuff. Well, did you know with any book, uh, whether it's a dictionary or an encyclopedia or the New York Times archive, if you use equidistant lettering, statistically you can come up with any word in the English language. If you, if you understand what I mean, take every seventh letter of the Encyclopedia Britannica, you'll get messages. You'll get words forming because of there only being 26 letters in our alphabet and because of the statistical probability, because of the usage of words in English language, there's some that are high. And, and in other words, statistically, you can get equidistant lettering messages out of any text. This person wrote a whole book on it and Christians bought it in droves and it was all kinds of hidden codes. And of course, you know, the, the whole, you know, uh, Da Vinci Code, fiasco of all that stuff people got into. Now we're into the harbinger stuff. And, and that's a little different twist on it. What you do is you look back at events and take verses and string them together and say, if this and this and this in the past, you know, like it talks about falling bricks. And of course, that's the World Trade Center, right? And, and that's what, and, and so those books, that's uh, the Harbinger, Harbinger, and I forget his other book, but just beware of sensational kind of chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea, or I found the Ark of the Covenant, because Christians are so uh, given to interest in anything to do with the Bible, they really jump on the bandwagon. This is, I mean, this is, this is an example. Um, What's his name from Cornerstone Church in Texas? Whatever his name is, Hagee, who is a tremendous preacher uh, and has a few unusual, he believes in the dual covenant, which is unbiblical, but I mean, uh, you know, I mean, he pretty much preaches the gospel, but he took something that's normal. I mean, this is right off of, uh, uh, this happens to be the, the winner of the some NASA award, but this is the moon turned to blood red over the Sousus of a desert lodge in the Namibaran Nature Reserve in Namibia. The stunning photograph, or photograph was taken by Skywatcher George Tucker in 2011. What's a blood red moon? The moon may turn red or coppery colored during a total portion of an eclipse. The red moon is possible because while the moon is in total shadow, some light from the sun. I mean, this is just beautiful, astronomical, wonderful stuff. So what's a blood moon? It's a harvest moon. I mean, so that's not the hype. The hype is that, that these things have been going on mathematically all the time, but when you have four close together, that's really interesting. But when you have those four that fall during Jewish feasts, then people get on overdrive. Because uh, it is true that God crucified Christ on Passover, buried him during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, that he stepped out of the tomb at the Feast of First Fruits, and that he uh, birthed his church on the day of Pentecost. And that's Feast 1, Feast 2, Feast 3, Feast 4. And so Feast 5, which is the trumpets, oh my, if there's a, one of those on that feast, then it could be the rapture because that's the next event. But the Bible does not say that we are supposed to watch for moons and watch for all that. Those signs are given to Israel in Matthew 24. And when you see the sign of the run to the mountains, they aren't given to us. But that's what a blood moon is. I mean, what has it done? I mean, look at this. This is CNN. Uh, I mean, wow. You can't get more unchristian than that. Sorry, Atlanta inhabitants there. Uh, but uh, Blood Moon has some expecting the end of the world, and they just start talking about, uh, this is the, the one at Easter, Tuesday, April 15th, uh, last year. And, and they talk about it. And this is one I told you about this morning. That was uh, uh, a week ago, this coming Monday. And that was the, right there's the fireball in 
um, Bangkok and people says, wow, the end of the world. And so it just causes hysteria. Um, what's the blood moon in the Bible? And that takes us right here to um, Joel chapter two. Now remember, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Naaman, Abak, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So we're, we're nine back from Matthew. So just, you know, if you can't find it, just back up from Matthew. But Joel is one of the minor prophets. And Joel is the, there are only three references to the blood moon in the Bible. And it doesn't say blood moon, which is a harvest moon, which is a moon, uh, a full moon uh, during a lunar eclipse that, that turns red. It doesn't, it, it doesn't say that uh, it's a blood moon. That's a new term um, that's gotten popular. It's called many other things, depending on whether you're in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, but you can read all that online. But look at verse 30. The Lord is talking through Joel, and he's, he's talking about this plague of the locusts, and, and the whole uh, prophecy is about, starting in chapter 2, the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord is code for the second coming of Christ. It's the day of the Lord and the Lord's wrath. And so he started talking about that, going all the way through, and then in verse 28, he talks about, it will come about after that, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. All. Um, it's going to be very interesting when we see this in, in the book of Acts. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and my men servant and my maid servants, I will pour my spirit in those days. Now look at verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and, on, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. And you notice that the only thing is pulled out in the four blood moon best-selling number nine on the New York Times bestseller list paperback for most of last year. The only thing that, that this whole concept pulled out is this blood moon. Um, there's so much more surrounding it. On the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, verse 32, and it shall come to pass that so whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. This is, this is uh, very, very much tied to, uh, to everything else the prophecy says about the end of the days and the second coming of Christ. And every verse is never to be wrestled out of its location and context. So that's the first time. The second one is in Acts 2.20. And all Acts 2.20 does, and if you go to the right, is it... It just quotes this verse. Um, Peter quotes this verse in his sermon, uh, the first Christian sermon um, of the day of Pentecost in the early church in Acts 2. And he starts in verse 16, and he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. I'm in Acts 2.18, and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to, into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter just references this and then uses it to explain the day of Pentecost, which was a not a pouring out of the Spirit of God on all flesh, nor on everybody, every maidservant, every uh, man servant, and your sons and daughters and fathers and everybody else. It was a partial pouring out of the Spirit of God only on those that were saved on the day of Pentecost. But Peter says, Israel, this is to show you that what's coming in the future, God has given you a foretaste of that today. Because none of the rest of it was going on. The sun didn't turn to darkness, the moon didn't turn to blood, and the great and awesome day of the Lord did not happen, and there were not wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath. It was just saying that the Spirit was coming as the down payment of the miraculous work yet future that was just beginning. So Peter quotes it. Now, look at the last one, Revelation 6. Now we're in the Revelation 6, and this is where it gets really interesting. This is the only other time 
Uh, for all the hype and for all the, the books written and everything else, it's not a very often repeated prophetic um, event. But it says in the sixth seal, this is Revelation 6 and verse 12, and I looked. And when he opened the sixth seal, behold, there was a great earthquake. So a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when shaken by a mighty wind, and the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, you can just read, and, and in verse 17, for the great day of wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And so this, these are the only three times that the blood moon is mentioned. Now, let's, whenever you're studying the Bible, uh, we're never in a hurry, and we're, we're never uh, wanting to, you know, uh, just, just gullibly follow anything. We're supposed to be Acts 17, 11 Bereans. And so you step back and you say, what is the context of that? Now here's, this is not in the Bible. It might be in the back of your Bible, it's not in the Bible. No Bible prophecy so neatly fits on a chart. This, this is just a kind of a, a pictorial view. This is common, uh, dispensational. Uh, the primary meaning of dispensationalism is that, that we see a distinction between Israel and the church. God has a plan, an eternal sovereign election of Israel, just like he has an eternal sovereign election of the church. He has a plan for both of us that he merges. It's merged in heaven. Uh, but... Just simple dispensationalism. Um, I think everything's pretty much in the right place. Christ's first coming to earth, this is Christmas, you know, Christ's birth, the crucifixion, he ascends back into heaven. I mean, we all track with that. Uh, 50 days after um, his resurrection, the church age, Pentecost to the rapture, uh, somewhere before the rapture, a word that's not in the Bible, it's a theological term, comes from harpazo, uh, which means to snatch, and it describes how Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch, and all of a sudden he disappeared, and he showed up somewhere else, and he was harpazoed, he was taken out, and so, and Paul was caught up, and I mean, it, it is a biblical word, but actually that comes from a Latin word from uh, the Latin Vulgate, but that doesn't matter. But it's a biblical doctrine of the rapture of the church. And what's amazing is it appears that universally the early church had this, held this belief. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, now this is where it's not as, as clearly delineated. Uh, there's some kind of a treaty Daniel talks about, uh, and then uh, in the midpoint of the seventh, seven year period, the, the last week of history, Israel's at peace, that's this part right here. Um, this is the seven years that comes from Daniel chapter nine. Then the Antichrist uh, breaks the treaty in the middle of the seven weeks, or I mean the seventh, 70th week, which is the seven year period. There's three and a half years of judgment and war. Uh, the believers, this is the time of, you know, the first Corinthians three and second Corinthians five. Bema seat of Christ up here. Then this is Revelation 19, the second coming of Christ to earth. And just before it, Jesus comes to intercept at Armageddon, the armies of the world, uh, at Megiddo, sweeping down, massacring and pillaging and destroying Israel. And when they get to Jerusalem, after they've ravaged more than half and two thirds of the Jews are exterminated, the remnant, the third is left. And so that's the second coming right there. And then Jesus talks about immediately following that, the sheep and goat judgment uh, the, to those on his right. He says, enter my kingdom, those on his left, the goats uh, he sends out. And uh, then Satan is bound. Now we're in Revelation 20, um, verses one through 10, uh, 21 through 10. Satan is bound for, and it says it six times, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. It's, it's a, quite repeated. And that's when Jesus, right here, uh, reigns on earth and fulfills massive amounts of the Old Testament that have never happened. 
that, that his promises to Israel that they would be the center of the nations and all the nations would come to them and his favor would be upon them and all that, which has never happened. They've been the scourge of the nations and they've been pogromed out of almost existence. Then Satan is released after a thousand years and he gets the whole world to follow him, uh, like the sands of the sea. And they all march to destroy the, the city of Jerusalem on earth. And by the way, no one enters the millennial kingdom unless they're saved. The sheep enter. So it's all believers. And yet believers don't necessarily have believing children. And so that's where the mass comes from and uh, the mass of, of uh, rebels. And so the Lord um, incinerates them now. We're in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And then they stand before him in judgment, the great white throne. And then we get to Revelation 21 and 22, which is the new heaven and new earth. So there you go. There's a, a quick order of events in biblical prophecy. But again, this wasn't packed in the scripture. You have to take the hundreds and hundreds of prophetic verses and examine them. So to do that, I thought I would just show them to you. This is typical Dallas seminary. This is, I mean, I got my doctorate at Dallas. This is Dr. Walvard's life work. And I'll just read it to you. He says that there are events immediately before the seven year period. Uh, the church is raptured. That comes from, I go to prepare a place and, and at the last trump and, and uh, the dead shall be raised and, and uh, we are kept from the wrath. So the church is raptured and uh, we look forward to that, not for the tribulation. The restrainer is removed, Second Thessalonians. The judgment seat of Christ is in heaven and believers are there before the throne. The Antichrist rises to power over what appears to be the, the revived Roman Empire, the Roman Confederacy. Now, the interesting thing about that is if you look at the Mediterranean basin, if you look overlay the Roman Empire uh, at its zenith, two-thirds of it today is Muslim. All of Northern Africa, all the Middle East, all the way up into Roman province of Asia Minor. And if you're reading the news, millions, about two to five million, are headed to Europe from war-torn areas of the Middle East. And so Europe is becoming Muslim to the core. Uh, and so it's very interesting what that future Roman Confederacy is. Uh, but the Antichrist rises to power. Uh, Daniel talks about that in 7 and uh, 20. And by the way, these little footnotes Walverd put in, what he said is everything on here, all dispensationalists agree on is just the exact order they don't. So this is just basically what uh, John MacArthur and Chuck Swindoll and Tim Left Behind LaHaye and you know all those who Dallas Seminary all would believe. At the beginning of the seven year period, the Antichrist, the coming ruler makes a covenant with Israel. I already showed you that on the chart. Um, then, so that's, that's at the beginning. Now these are just in the first half. So that first three and a half year period of the seven year period, Israel is living at peace, says in unwalled villages. That's really interesting uh, because of all the security walls. I mean, everybody's building walls these days. Saudi Arabia's building walls. Israel's building more walls. I mean, Hungary, the nation is building walls for all these uh, uh, refugees coming in. Temple sacrifices are instituted. That's really interesting. Uh, that finally the Jews get their temple uh, back in Jerusalem, which would take a miracle. Uh, there is a global church, and it's not a very wholesome one if you read Revelation 17. Then Gog and his allies invade Palestine, uh, the land of Israel from the north. That's what Ezekiel 38 talks about. And again, another little footnote that not everybody agrees. Some equate that with Armageddon. And Gog and his allies are destroyed by God. And, and it is very possible with what's shaping up. I mean, we now have Russians fighting in Syria against ISIS. And we have Americans fighting in Syria against the side Russia is fighting for. And so it's almost America and Russia are facing off in Syria today. We have special forces and everybody else over there operating in whatever they call them, trainers and helpers and, and all that. So it's a very interesting time right now. Um, very, very much um, interesting. Now in the middle of the seven year period, uh, also Revelation 12 talks about Satan being consigned to the earth, energizing the Antichrist. At the midpoint, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel. 
And uh, Daniel 9.27 says that the ruler of the people that destroyed Jerusalem that's to come. And so this Antichrist is a Roman Empire attached person. The 10 kings and the Antichrist destroy the world church. 144,000 Israelites are saved and sealed. Now again, the order of these, um, you know, it, it doesn't say in the Bible, this happens in this state. Um, this this uh, uh, three and a half years, the uh, second half are called the great tribulation. That's what Revelation 7 says. It's called great distress, the time of distress, and the time of Jacob's troubles. That's in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. And what the second half is like is, uh, and, and this is not just in this time, but it's, it's heightened. Rebellion against the truth in the professing church. Um, you know, in other words, there's still going to be all the church buildings, but people are apostate to the core. The Antichrist becomes the world ruler. That's the first seal. Um, in uh, Revelation 6, uh, and on and on it goes, he's the lawless one. Um, the reason I'm going, I'm trying to get to the blood moon. Do you see it? Did everybody see it? Now we finally come to it. Look, it, remember? Right there it is. See, it, it can't be, it can't be on the 28th of this month. I mean, there's going to be a harvest moon. It's going to be beautiful, but it can't be that one because see where that's fitting. There is war and famine and death. That's the second, third, and fourth seals. Um, and remember, all these footnotes are just saying that there's disagreement on exactly among dispensationalists where they are. Converted multitudes from every nation are martyred. That's the fifth seal. Uh, and again, that's another footnoted one. And then after that comes this. After we have the actual unfolding of, of the Antichrist and all the tribulation terrors, natural disturbances come. That's the last time this blood moon is mentioned. And there's worldwide fear of divine wrath, the sixth seal, that giant earthquake I read to you about, the sky rolling back like a scroll, and the Antichrist image and abomination is set up for worship, and the two witnesses begin their ministry. See, that's the biblical context of the blood moon. Uh, false prophet does his thing, and the mark of the beast occurs. Israel scatters as they're being hunted. Uh, Jerusalem gets overrun by Gentiles. The Antichrist and false prophet keep deceiving. The gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed. Um, and, and what's interesting is, during this second half, there are more concentration of conversions to Christ than any other time in history. Numberless multitudes of people. Um, you just can't count them, but they're killed. Uh, they're persecuted and then beheaded. And Israel is chased by the Antichrist, and of course, uh, the Lord protects them. Then these trumpet judgments telescopically began. In other words, they, the trumpet come right out of the seal, and they just, it's kind of like a popping out of, of rapid fire judgments. The bold judgments follow those in Revelation 16. They're poured out by God on the Antichrist empire, and the people start cursing God. Oh, there it is again. This is where Joel, that verse, shows up in, in uh, most conservative eschatology, the concluding events. The two witnesses are slain, the two witnesses are resurrected, and signs appear in the earth and sky. And part of that is the smoke and fire and pillars of smoke and the great earthquakes and the moon becomes like blood. What is it probably a long period of time, the sun getting black and the moon like blood probably is because of all these earthquakes and, and uh, solar disturbances that, that there might be volcanoes or whatever that makes the atmosphere so filled with dust that the moon looks red and the sun looks uh, dark. And then, of course, Christ returns with the armies of heaven. That's what Matthew 24 talks about. And, of course, that's the second coming of Revelation. Okay. Remember I said every doctrine... Christ should be right in the middle. How does Jesus want us to apply that? Does he want us to buy, like the 700 Club says, the, the heaven meal plan for only $7,000? You can have enough meals to make it through all of these disturbances. I mean, they'll talk about it on the radio. The blood moon, they'll be advertising their blood moon book, and they will be selling rations for you. 
to prep, be a prepper, you know, and prepare for all this. Is that what Jesus wants us to do to apply Revelation 6 uh, through 19? Not for that. Now, there's nothing wrong with having food and water and medicine and whatever. Uh, and whatever degree you like to be prepared, that's good. I mean, common sense. The book of Proverbs says prepare. When we lived in California, all of us had our little earthquake box in our trunk. In case the whole city fell down, you would be able to live for a week on survival on the highways with your little earthquake box. And they always told us in California, and Bonnie had one in her, bo her car, and I had one in my car, and we had one in our house. You just were getting ready for earthquakes. That's good. Buying enough meals to make it through the tribulation because you read the book is not good because that is withdrawal from society. And that's never good. Okay, that's not ever God's plan, to withdraw from society. Uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus said, now this is interesting, Jesus gave his longest answer to this. And he applied it for us. And that's what I want to do with you. Matthew 24, let's, let's turn to Matthew 24. So back up from Revelation. And I want to show you Christ's longest answer that spans, in fact, it's in uh, each of the synoptic gospels. Matthew 24 was Christ's longest answer to any question he was ever asked in the four gospels. In fact, Jesus answers that question across the pages of all three synoptic gospels because Christ's longest answer to any question ever asked him in his three plus ministry, year ministry fills Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Four entire chapters just packed with inspired divine truth to answer the question about the end of days, the doctrine of eschatology. So if you want to put Christ right in the center, remember, if it's biblical doctrine, it will lead to Christ, like we saw this morning. If you want to put him right in the middle of this doctrine, it's an amazing way to emphasize this topic. Jesus says, I'll show you how to apply it the end of days. And so he does. And, and what he does is he gives us five quick stories. Have you ever wondered about those stories? You know, the, uh, the virgins and all these stories that Jesus tells rapid fire at the end of his ministry with the disciples listening in this, this rapid fire. Uh, and basically the summary is, he says, I want you to know my plan. I want you to keep watch. I want you to avoid distractions. I want you to live for what counts, and I don't want you to waste your life. Now, look, look at starting in chapter 24, and I talked so much I didn't get there, Matthew 24, and, and look what Jesus says starting in verse 32. Now, learn this parable. He's just finished, uh, look at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven. It doesn't say it's a blood moon, but it's going to be darkened. Uh, the sign of the Son of Man, verse 30, will appear in the heavens. And verse 31, he will send forth his angels the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus ends his, his survey of the future. By the way, which parallels... Revelation 6, onward, in an amazing way. And then look what he says. Now, here's how you apply it. Use your prophetic, I mean, the disciples were eating this up. They were having a private briefing by the God of the universe about the future, and he was pointing out what buildings were going to get destroyed and what weren't, and they were just all over it. And it, it was very interesting to them, like it is to us. And look what Jesus says. Now, learn a parable from the fig tree. And lesson number one is uh, the trends that Jesus says are going to be visible. When you see all these things, know it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Jesus said, know my plan. Not so you can get the prepper 7,000 meal kit. Uh, that wasn't the idea. Know that God is in charge of history and that he has a plan. Now remember, we've already looked uh, way back in 08 and 09. If you can remember so far back, we looked at what the earth looks like when Jesus returns. Now see, that's a way of looking at prophecy. If you look at the earth at the second coming, then you know just before his second coming, those things are in place. And there's a lot of them that we all know now. I mean, with the new... Um, 
what is it called, Mercat and Periscope apps, you can live stream from your, your phone, live stream. You can become a, like a CNN person and live stream to the web real-time events with just a little app through Wi-Fi. That's why Jesus said, when I return in Revelation 11, he already told us that everyone in the world will be watching what I just showed you, those two witnesses being killed by the Antichrist. Now, for centuries, people said, well, obviously that's hyperbole because nobody in the world watched anything except what was in their town, unless they, they traveled by horseback or ship or walked uh, or chariot or something. But they, they didn't watch everything at once. They heard about it. In fact, the emperor of Rome died, and some of the generals on the front line didn't know it for almost a year. Wow. That's how slow life was back then. And they had to come back to Rome and find out who their new supreme commander was because it, news traveled at the speed of horse, not at the speed of light. Uh, so the first thing Jesus said is you can know the plan. And you can read that. I mean, uh, the sign of the Son of Man, verse 30, will appear in the heavens and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in his clouds of power and great glory and all that. Now look at verse 32, parable um, 32 to 35. He continues and, and says, now learn the parable from this. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, that's the trends. Jesus said they're like birth pangs. And what's going to happen is there's going to be earthquakes, but there's always been earthquakes, but there are going to be earthquakes and more earthquakes are going to get closer and they're going to get bigger. And there are going to be wars and there's always been wars, but there are going to be wars and they're going to be closer and they are going to be ethnic divisions. Nation against nation, uh, people group against people group, and, and it's going to just kind of break loose all the combo we've done. So that's number one. Uh, now, look at verse 36. He says, I want you to keep watch. Uh, the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. For as in the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What were the days of Noah like? People were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. And they were only thinking evil continually. I mean, that's the days of Noah are times of peace and prosperity and, and normal things going on and a lot of sin. And Jesus said, keep watch. Um, for as in the days, verse 36, before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they didn't know the flood until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. It'll be totally unexpected. Uh, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the women will be grinding. Watch, therefore, you don't know when the Lord is coming. Jesus is talking to people that are saved. And what he's saying is, if you think about it, and just for a moment, think about it, um, what he's saying, there, there are these examples. Uh, for example, there's Lot, and Lot was saved out of the destruction. He was dragged right out of the destruction. Um, and, and through it, basically, he was in Sodom, dragged out, and it was burned up. Abraham was kept from the destruction. He moved his tent and never went in there, and the people of Sodom were destroyed in it. So there's always, if you notice, these three groupings. Um, uh, look at Enoch. Enoch was saved out before the flood. Noah was saved out in the ark through the flood. And uh, the rest of the people, the world, was destroyed during the flood. And those are just two simple examples that Jesus uses Noah, but he also says, remember Lot and Lot's wife and all that, uh, one of the shortest of his imperatives. Noah... Uh, is a picture of Israel being saved in the ark of safety, protected by God through, um, the, through the destruction. Enoch is before, that's the church, that's the raptured ones, and this is the world that's destroyed. And so even in the days of Noah, you have Enoch getting out before it happens. You have Noah uh, and those eight souls are with him in the ark being saved through it. And so what the Lord is saying is, I want you, whoop, I want you to keep watch. 
And when you start seeing these things happening, know that your redemption draws near. And we could go through that, but verse 44 says it well. Therefore, be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. Did you know they caught that message? Did you know the early church almost universally was constantly saying, might be today, might be today. I want to live today like Jesus is coming today. Paul used, he used personal pronouns. For we shall be caught up together with him in the air. And we, 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 we. And he's acting like he's part of the group going in the rapture 2,000 years ago. That's how, how they listened to what Christ said. And Jesus said, therefore, be ready. They says, oh, we want to keep watch. He's coming quickly. We want to be ready. Now look at verse 45, his third story. Each of these are so unique. They're, they're an amazing little story. And this one is about avoiding distraction. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, verse 45, whom his master's made ruler? Christ left us to do something. He gave us a great commission. He filled us with his spirit. He gave us gifts and calling. And blessed is that servant, verse 46. Remember, we want to be well done, good and faithful servant. How do we do that? Blessed is that servant whom the master, when he comes, will find doing what he left him doing. Are we? Or are we weighed down with the cares of this life? Are we so busy trying to buy the biggest possible house? And we're going to, you know, we're going to squeeze for a while and work two jobs to afford that house and it cripples us from being flexible, responsive, and it puts our roots and our stakes deeper and deeper in this world. Nothing wrong with nice houses, especially those that open them up for the early church and, and allowed the church to meet 100 people in a home, like the early church met in, in both Jerusalem and in Ephesus. But I'm not sure the Lord says riches are dangerous and they cause great care. There's a care that's needed for riches. The more I have, the more I want. The more I have, the more you want it. The more I have, the more I can lose. I mean, there's so many cares of riches. So avoid the distraction, Jesus says, of, of thinking, verse 48, my master is delaying, Jesus isn't coming very quickly and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. And there's a lot of ways we could apply that. And the master of that servant will come in a day when he's not looking in an hour and will cut him in two and appoint him as portion with the hypocrites. And there'll be, that's bad. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's always a sign of lostness. And these are the people that say they follow Christ, but their lives, they're not avoiding distractions. And here's the, the last one. Look at... Uh, 25, last two, 25, 1 to 13. Uh, remember, there's no second chance to live for the Lord. Um, that's the parable of the foolish uh, virgins, and uh, they, they aren't ready. And then finally, verses 14 downward um, to 30. Don't waste your life. Um, the Lord of those servants, 25, 19, uh, comes and settles accounts, and that's where that text comes from, verse 21 of 25, Matthew 21, or 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Faithfulness equals fruitfulness. And uh, he's equating that there are degrees of rewards. That's what verse 20 is about. And Beware of wasting your life. So why would Jesus tell the disciples this when they aren't even going to be here in the tribulation? They aren't even going to be, you know, why did he, he, he told them general stories and laid truth beside things that they could understand at the moment as they're, you know, at this time of uncertainty, he's saying he's going and he's saying, you can know my plan. You're supposed to keep watch. I'm coming quickly. Avoid anything that distracts you. Live for what counts. Make sure, because you aren't going to get a second chance to, to do that. And don't waste your life. Be a, a good and faithful servant. So, the people that heard this, what were they like? The first generation. They actually heard Jesus they actually knew the disciples. They actually heard the disciples say what Jesus said. They actually heard the disciples say what they were inspired to do. The message that was heard by those early believers and lived out was that they were awaiting Christ's return daily. Because he said it. He said, 
Verse 13 of chapter 25, watch, you don't know the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And then he said in verse 44 of chapter 24, be ready, you don't know when he's going to come. He's going to come when you don't expect it. So be constantly looking for his return. Wow. So that leads us to this. What, what did they say about the coming of Christ? And real quickly, go with me to, to Hebrews. We're in Matthew. Go to Hebrews, and we have 14 minutes uh, or less. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 10. And, and look what, first of all, in 24 and 25, and you all know this, uh, what the Lord said is, the writer of Hebrews cited the imminent return of Christ as a reason to remain faithful. And he said, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now look up from your Bibles for a minute. Guess what the purpose of coming to church is? To show off our new shoes, right? To drive our new car. To show off how many different, you know, outfits we have. Uh, to come and check what other, who's sitting with who. Or to find someone and go out to dinner with them. Or to, you know, what is the, what is the biblical purpose we come together on Sunday? Look at verse 24. It says, let us consider kata noeo. You know what that means? Kata is down against or upon, and noeo is the mind. Let it be pressing down on your mind how to stir up to love and good works the people around us. Did you hear what Phil said just before the um, greeting time? He said, go share what you've been finding in the word or how you can pray for one another or whatever. Did you know that's why we gather it's interesting, we gather like we think we're coming here and don't want to miss one piece of the scripted events on the stage. Do you know where the real ministry goes on? Out there. We're supposed to be looking around and looking for someone that we can, see what it says? That we can consider to stir them up to loving one another in the Lord and good works to one another in the, for the purpose of the Lord. And verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as already in the first century some had gotten in the habit of doing, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what they're saying? Hey, if the Lord comes and he asked us together, we want to be gathered. Uh, wouldn't you hate for the Lord to return and have to whistle you out of a golf cart, you know, or out of a boat, or, you know, whatever, instead of out of the gathering of holding the pictures of his body and his blood? Can you imagine at the rapture how much nicer it would be to be holding communion in your hands than a steering wheel out on the lake on the resurrection celebration Sunday? You know what I mean, and I am getting off script there. That was a little bad. It does say, though, exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see that, that coming of Christ at any moment? Here's the next one. Look at James 5. I mean, James is probably, so it's just Hebrews, James. Don't go too fast or you'll pass right over, but James 5. And look what 7 and 8 say. Therefore, be patient, brethren. This is probably the first New Testament epistle. James is Christ's earthly brother pastoring the church at the first church in Jerusalem. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently until he receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Wow. And then look at verse 9. Don't grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. He said, the Lord... He's right outside the door, ready to pop in at any moment. You don't know when. He's listening at the door to, to us. And, and he is the one that's going to, we're going to stand before his judgment seat. So be patient. Keep living in a Christ-like way. From the very earliest days of the church, the apostles and those first-generation Christians nurtured an earnest expectation and fervent hope that Christ might suddenly return at any moment to gather his church to heaven. And as James wrote probably the earliest of the New Testament epistles, he expressly told his, his believers of that church that the Lord's return was imminent. He's at the door. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 7, that's the very next book. 1 Peter 4, look at verse 7. Peter echoes the same expectations when he wrote, the end of all things is at hand, verse 7. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Um, 
amazing. And then John adds to the chorus. Keep going, jump over 2 Peter and go to 1 John chapter 2 and two verses, 18 and 28. This is what John says. Little children, it is the last hour. That's in the first century. It's the last hour. He was convinced of it. He knew Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was the disciple Jesus loved. He listened to everything Jesus said. He was convinced it was the last hour. You know, we, we talk about the New Testament church and, and this and that. What, what characterized them is they really believed what Jesus said. They didn't explain it away. It's the last hour. And as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, which we know that it's the last hour. He says, I'm seeing the proliferation of Antichrist. But look at verse 28. Wow. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may, be, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That's a sobering verse. Born-again Christians will be taken by the Lord when he returns, but some will be looking for him and exhorting one another and stirring up, and others will be ashamed at how he found them. I didn't say that. John said that. That's a very sobering verse. Okay, we're getting close. What are God's goals? Remember I said, if we're looking at... You know, this whole thing was Joel 2 and blood moons. You know, that's a hot current issue. But actually what it's about is prophecy and the end of the world. So what the end of the world is for Christians, biblical expectancy. What that means is we expect that the Lord's going to do what he said. He's going to judge the earth. He's going to right all wrongs. He's going to come and rule. He is going to make the deserts to bloom. He's going to make the water pure. There's going to be no carnivorous beasts, no poisonous creatures. He's going to fulfill all of his promises. We expect him to do all that. But what are we supposed to be doing? Buying the prepper kit? Hiding? You know, getting as far away from sin, you know, 10 miles from all known sin? No. It's, it's very interesting, and, and there are some expectations. Here's the first one. We read it. Faithfulness and assembling together and encouraging one another. This is the first. Expectancy should motivate us. If you really believe that the Lord is coming at any moment, then we should have it heavy on our mind how to stir up love and good works in other believers. So you have to be near them, and the way you're near them is not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, even though some first century people were, but exhorting one another. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be exhorters, and more and more because we're seeing the day approaching. We're hearing the sound of the hoofbeats coming. So the first motivation, what, what expectancy you should motivate us to is toward that stirring up and gathering together. The second is steadfastness and kindness. What James said in that passage we read is, establish your heart, get steadfast. Go through the spiritual disciplines of having your heart fixed on the word of the Lord so you know his expectations for his return. And then be kind, don't grumble, Uh, don't be condemned. The judge is standing at the door. Don't be found unloving toward other believers, uh, the one another's. This is a, a, a negative one another. Be kind to one another would be the positive. Don't grumble against one another is the the negative. Did you know when Christians are at each other, they are not able to to operate in the power of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is grieved when we grumble. And Well, that was our whole summer study when we, um, you know, are taking pot shots through gossip and, and, and anything else that that the early church was experiencing. So we're supposed to be steadfast, get our hearts established uh, by the Lord and be kind. That's the second thing prophecy should do to us. Here's another one. All these are the passages that are tied to the Lord's coming. And 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. You know, at hand means it's close. It's coming. Therefore, what? Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Gregoreo, that's the Greek word Gregory, 
is a Greek word, gregoreo, means to be looking around, being alert. Be alert in your prayers. Be serious, be focused. Don't be weighed down with dissipation. Don't have your mind ungirded. Don't let your mind go off in every direction. The Bible says, it, when it comes to evil, be like children. Have you ever noticed that you can talk, if a child is young enough, you can talk about stuff and they don't even understand it. They're not acquainted with what you're talking about. And there's a level that a child stays at where they're blissfully unaware. God says we should be quite unaware of the unfruitful works of darkness and the deeds that people do in that. Rather than watching those deeds on 60 foot wide screens. And, and being grieving to the Holy Spirit and quenching him, we're supposed to be serious about these things and watchful in our prayers. And therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, Peter said, what kind of people should we be in holy conduct and godliness? Prayer and holy conduct are byproducts of expectancy of Christ's return, and we should be expectant. And then First John says, that we should have purity and Christ-likeness. When he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. And a good verse on this is 2 Corinthians 7, 1, which says, wherefore lay apart all filthiness, uh, that, that we are supposed to purge ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the mind. We are supposed to purify ourselves as he is pure because we want to uh, see him as he is and we want to be found uh, pleasing him because we long for his coming. And it's 7.12. So this is what I thought we should do. We stopped three minutes early. So what I thought is, I'm gonna pray for one of those minutes and then you have two minutes to stir someone else up around you, okay? So let's all stand up and I'm gonna pray a short prayer and see if you can, maybe you've never stirred anybody up. Tell them I'm trying, I don't know what to do, but stir, okay? And then don't forget to go have your ice cream and uh, if you're college aged uh, up in the block, okay? Father, I pray that you teach us to long for your coming and that the purpose of, of expectancy is to have this kindness, to have this seriousness about prayer, to stir one another up for love and good works and exhorting one another. I pray that you teach us more and more how to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>